welcome to another episode of the New Discourses podcast. Guess who we're talking about today? Did you guess Paulo Freire? <laughs> oh crap, here we are again. Actually, I I will come back and do Pedagogy of the Oppressed, as I promised. I'm not doing that yet. What I actually want to do is I want to read through to you. I've written an encyclopedia entry for my social justice encyclopedia that I finally started working on a little bit again recently. I don't know how much work I'm going to do with it right now, but I've done a few new entries. Check them out. ESG, SEL, all kinds of good stuff. Well, I've also written one for, well, Drag Queen Story Hour, but also Freirian. In other words, what does it mean to be of the thought of Paulo Freire? Okay, and so I figured that this is such a great capstone on everything that I've been saying about Paulo Freire that I'm just going to read this to you. Now, I don't mean to waste your time or belittle you if you read it. You know what's going on. You don't have to listen. But I know a lot of you don't read. Not very much. Not things that are pretty long. And this is fairly long. 6,000 something words. I know a lot of you listen while you're doing other things, while you're traveling, while you're driving, while you're, you know, working or doing the lawn or whatever. And you can't read while you're doing those things. And so I just know that this is the case. And I don't mean any uh, insult to anybody, but I'm actually for the most part, just going to read this entry. And um, I think it's a good capstone on our exploration of Paulo Freire for the moment. I will come back and do Pedagogy of the Oppressed. That's mostly because the Brazilians are desperate for me to do it, as far as I can tell from what they're reaching out to me about. But as if you, if you know much about my social justice encyclopedia, which is called Translations from the Wokish, it's on the New Discourses website. You should go to the social justice encyclopedia and share the articles or the entries there that try to explain the words. I think I could rewrite most of them now and make them tighter and sharper and more to the point. But maybe one day if I have time and can turn around and look backwards at those things, it'll be worth doing. But if you, I I say that because I bring up the idea of going to look at it because if you're familiar with it or not, you need to know that I start off by reading a passage or writing or quoting a passage from their literature that reflects the given idea or uses the given term. In this case, Since the term is Freirean, I'm going to read something to you explaining the ideas of Paulo Freire. This is by, and then I'll get into my own commentary. So it starts with their usage, woke usage, social justice usage, whatever you want, followed with New Discourses commentary, which I write. Okay, so uh, the source here is Henry Giroux. That's Paulo Freire's great evangelist. This is something you've all heard if you're listening to the Freire podcast before, but I'm going to bring it back to your attention. This is from the introduction that Giroux was invited to write for The Politics of Education, which is Paulo Freire's 1985 book that broke him out into the North American colleges of education scene, thanks to Henry Giroux's hard evangelistic work on behalf of his uh, guru, um, Paulo. So this is what Henry has to say at uh, at this part of the introduction. It's just a couple of paragraphs. Within the discourse of theologies of liberation, Freire fashions a powerful theoretical antidote to the cynicism and despair of many left radical critics. So we'll talk quite a bit about that, but that's the key understanding of the context of Freire as he's solving the Marxist problem of reproduction. But I'm supposed to just read this, so let me just start again and just read. So within the discourse of the theologies of liberation, Freire fashions a powerful theoretical antidote to the cynicism and despair of many left radical critics. The utopian character of his analysis is concrete in its nature and appeal, and takes as its starting point collective actors in their various historical settings and the particularity of their problems and forms of oppression. It is utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender to the risks and dangers that face all challenges to dominant power structures. It is prophetic in that it views the kingdom of God as something to be created on earth, but only through a faith in both other human beings and the necessity of permanent struggle. The notion of faith that emerges in Freire's work is informed by the memory of the oppressed, the suffering that must not be allowed to continue, and the need to never forget that the prophetic vision is an ongoing process, a vital aspect of the very nature of human life. In short, by combining the discourses of critique and possibility, 
Freire joins history and theology in order to provide the theoretical basis for a radical pedagogy that combines hope, critical reflection, and collective struggle. It is at this juncture that the work of Paulo Freire becomes crucial to the, de to the development of a radical pedagogy. For in Freire we find the dialectician of contradictions and emancipation. In Freire's work, a discourse is developing that bridges the relationship between agency and structure, a discourse that situates human action and constraints forged in historical and contemporary practices, while also pointing to the spaces, contradictions, and forms of resistance that raise the possibility for social struggle. That's the ending of the quotation from Henry Giroux describing Paulo Freire. So what you can see is that he has somehow combined Marxist thought, that's all your liberation, emancipation, historical, blah, 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 collective struggle, yada, 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 critical, blah, blah, blah. He's combining Marxism with education, with religion. And so he's fusing together theology, specifically liberation theology, which was mentioned, the theologies of liberation, with education, and with Marxism. Okay, and now we'll go on to my commentary about what it means to be Freirean. In other words, to exhibit uh, traits that trace back to or derive from or are similar to um, Paulo Freire's ideas about Marxism, education, I guess, and religion. So this is the New Discourses commentary. And again, I'm going to mostly read this. I have a feeling I'm going to find all kinds of like typos and awkward sentences. I'm going to try to read it and offer some explanation here and there, but mostly read it. Probably a lot of explanation. We'll see how it goes. Freirean refers to the work, ideas, and impact of the Marxist Brazilian Paulo Freire, who claimed to have devised an innovative model of education that in practice retools education into a form of neo-Marxist thought reform, a.k.a. brainwashing. The Freirean theory of education could also be called one of two things, which were the titles of, his two mo of two of his most important books, A Pedagogy of the Oppressed, book 1970, or A Pedagogy of Hope, the book is 1992. It is more important to call Freirean pedagogy a pedagogy of the oppressed than a pedagogy of hope, because the hope referred to is specifically critical hope, which is a hope that Marxism will work this time through sufficient consciousness and critique. As such, Freirean refers to the Marxist educational ideas that form the backbone for critical pedagogy as it emerged in the 1980s and 1990s, largely following the work of Paulo Freire's greatest evangelist, Henry Drew. Of note, Freirean ideas have had tremendous currency in educational circles, with Freire being the third most cited academic author of all time, and his book Pedagogy of the Oppressed occupying pride of place in every college of education in North America. Before continuing to describe the Freirean pedagogy and, among others, of Freire's ideas, it is important to note that Paulo Freire wasn't merely a Marxist or an education theorist, but was also a dedicated religionist. Freire was deeply steeped in liberation theology, which is Marxism posing as Catholicism. It is in this context, the religious context, that Freire's is a pedagogy of hope, which would more accurately be described as a pedagogy of faith that relentless critique through perpetually deepening critical consciousness can deliver the liberated Marxist utopia. And I encourage people here to refer also, CF, that is, confer, Hebrews 11.1 1, on the relationship between hope and faith. So I do think that the conflation here between hope and faith is... Um, I think that the, the conflation between or the, the connection between hope and faith here is critical to understanding what Paulo Freire did, uh, what Paulo Freire brought, why Paulo Freire's ideas were so influential. And I've talked about that in a bunch of other podcasts. I just want to highlight, though, that it's very important that kind of like that faith is the hope and that which isn't seen. I know I'm 
butchering Hebrews 11. One. I don't have it in front of me, and I'm not going to look it up real quick. Uh, so the idea, though, that, that faith is a particular kind of hope, this is the kind of like um, arc that Freire connected. It's, or if you want, it's the keystone that he dropped in so that the arch or the bridge or whatever can stay up to cross from the problem of reproduction side of the Marxist landscape to the woke nightmare that we live in right now that's enabled them to attempt another cultural revolution throughout the West, which of course is very advanced here in the United States. So continuing... Breaking down Freire's ideas, or what is meant by Freirean, has to take place on two levels, broad and specific. Freire's method is very specific and must briefly be detailed as such, but at the same time it is only properly comprehensible as an application of the broad strokes of his religious Marxism. And so I've done a lot of stuff developing the religion of Marxism. In fact, I don't think it was possible for me to understand Freire at all until I understood Marxism as a theology because Freire is sort of a kind of theologian, as it's obvious, and then that he is sort of the kind of like the great, if you want to like a, a fitting image of, of who Freire was, he's the great revivalist of the Marxist faith. Marxism, Marxism as a faith was burning down through the second half of the 20th century. The critical Marxists were not doing good. Um, everything was kind of negative. Everything was kind of stalling. Herbert Marcuse had lit a fuse into the racial minorities, etc., the Soviet Union was collapsing. It looked like China was opening up. Oh, how stupid were we for that? But nevertheless, Marxism wasn't having a good run at the end of the 20th century, so far as we could tell. And Paulo Freire actually is the one who is the revivalist of the religious side of this. Um, carrying on then, it is fitting then to, to begin with a discussion of Paulo Freire's most famous and most influential book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which was published originally in English in 1970, although the manuscript was drafted in Portuguese and finished in 1968. By the way, it was not published in Portuguese until after it was published in English. Details of the pedagogy aside, a pedagogy of the oppressed should in concept use the fact of oppression to, perfor to perform an educational function. For Freire, at the time, blending his Marxism-inspired post-colonialist background with his intense mid 1960s study of Marxism proper, the education the fact of oppression has to offer is a structural education, that is, a view into understanding the injustice of the world in terms of Marxist analysis of social and economic structures as determinant features of life in society. Just as an aside, it's not in the original, what I'm talking about here is the Marxist doctrine, the old kind of economic Marxist doctrine, which carries over into the modern woke version in a degree called material determinism. And then also the more modern version, which is structural determinism, which is this idea that the either material conditions of your life and the structure in which the social structure in which they exist or the, the broader sociocultural kind of cultural Marxist structural conditions of your life race, sex, gender, so on, position within the social hierarchy, etc. All of these things are actually determinant of who you are. This is what Marx referred to as the inversion of praxis. People do praxis or activism on the world, and the inversion of praxis transforms them, so it determines who they are as people. And so the material conditions limit your range of subjectivity, your range of imagination, your range of creativity, what you find yourself in, whether that's classism, whether that's racism, whether that's sexism, transphobia, homophobia, you have these limitations placed on not just who you can be and who you are, but what you can imagine being. And Marxism is supposed to break that open because that's the inversion of praxis and the inversion of praxis con conditions you through determinant features of life and society. And the only way that you can break free is by developing critique of those structures, and that's basically the Marxist idea in a nutshell. So the point of the pedagogy of the oppressed is to learn to see the world from the standpoint of the oppressed and to understand that the standpoint of the oppressed is only duly informed and politically literate when it speaks from a position of Marxist structural analysis and neo-Marxist critical theory. So in other words, you've got to become a critical theorist in order to understand the world correctly. Paulo Freire's education is designed to 
use the fact of oppression as they conceive of it in order to teach people that. That's the, that's the summary of what it means to be Frarian. Freire actually goes quite a bit further with his notion of the pedagogy of the oppressed, which he refers to as gaining political literacy, so that the illiterate can, quote, learn to speak the world, sorry, learn to speak the word to proclaim the world. I did find a typo. As conscious political subjects. He says that one must die and be reborn on the side of the oppressed, literally comparing it to a personal Easter of death and resurrection that must replace the Christian Easter celebration. He is completely explicit about this profound religious instruction in the 10th chapter of his 1985 book, The Politics of Education. To quote him at full length on this point is necessary to fully believe it. So guess what we're going to do? I know you've heard it before, but you're going to hear it again. This is Freire from Politics of Education, Chapter 10. In committing themselves to the oppressed, they begin a new period of apprenticeship. So these are the people that he's brainwashed. This is not, however, to say that their commitment to the oppressed is thereby finally sealed. It will be severely tested during the course of this new apprenticeship when confronted in a more serious and profound way than ever before with the hazardous nature of existence. To pass such a test is not easy. This new apprenticeship will violently break down the elitist concept of existence they had absorbed while being ideologized. The sine qua non, the highest possible expression, the apprenticeship demands is that, first of all, they really experience their own Easter. That they die as elitists so as to be resurrected on the side of the oppressed. That they be born again with the beings who were not allowed to be. Such a process implies a renunciation of myths that are dear to them, the myth of their superiority, of their purity of soul, of their virtues, their wisdom, the myth that they save the poor, the myth of the neutrality of the church, of theology, education, science, technology, the myth of their own impartiality. From these grow the other myths, of the inferiority of other people, of their spiritual and physical impurity, and of the absolute ignorance of the oppressed. This Easter, which results in the changing of consciousness, must be existentially experienced. The real Easter is not commemorative rhetoric. It is praxis. It is historical involvement. The old Easter of rhetoric is dead, with no hope of resurrection. It is only in the authenticity of historical praxis that Easter becomes the death that makes life possible. But the bourgeois worldview, basically necrophiliac, death-loving, and therefore static, is unable to accept the supremely biophiliac, life-loving experience of Easter. The bourgeois mentality, which is far more than just a convenient abstraction, kills the profound historical dynamism of Easter and turns it into no more than a date on the calendar. The lust to possess, a sign of the necrophiliac worldview, rejects the deeper meaning of resurrection. Why should I be interested in rebirth if I hold in my hands as objects to be possessed the torn body and soul of the oppressed? I can only experience rebirth at the side of the oppressed by being born again with them in the process of liberation. I cannot turn such a rebirth into a means of owning the world since it is essentially a means of transforming the world. And that's the end of that wonderful passage from Paulo Freire in The Politics of Education, chapter 10. I continue, of course, when Freire here refers to this personal death and resurrection into the standpoint of the oppressed being a means of transforming the world, he is referring to the specific Marxist project which is to transform the world into a humanized form. The ninth chapter of this same book is about, quote, humanistic education, and it focuses on precisely this idea in greater depth and unambiguously in the way Karl Marx meant it. He even distinguishes between humanistic and humanitarian approaches, with the latter being a mere means to reproduce systems of oppression and to domesticate people into the kind of silent fatalism Marx condemned 
in religion as the opiate of the people. That is also what, quote, historical involvement in praxis refers to. So in broad strokes, the Frarian view, especially toward education, is that the fact of oppression in the world provides an opportunity to lead people to be born again in a way that lets them see the world from a position, from the position, sorry, not merely of being oppressed, but of understanding that oppression is the way Marxists do things. I'm sure I'd find a freaking typo. That's wonderful. Let's try this again. So let's start the whole sentence again, because I don't even know where I got lost. So the Frarian view is the fact that the oppression in the world provides an opportunity to lead people to be born again in a way that lets them see the world from the position not merely of being oppressed, but also of understanding that oppression, the way Marxists see it, is a structural phenomenon. Everything in his educational program, thus in the critical pedagogy that follows from it, hinges on this bedrock Frarian belief. So that was a big key sentence to have to, you know, find a typo in. But here we are. What are we going to do? The big point that I was making in that badly worded sentence is that the key piece of the Frarian idea, the entire backbone of the Frarian idea, is that the fact that oppression exists in the world allows people to learn that the world is structurally ordered to create and maintain oppression. That's the, the key idea. I'll rewrite that before we publish. Rather than being despondent about the circumstances of oppression, I said, Freire is hopeful and energized. This is because he sees this as an opportunity to raise critical consciousness under a false banner of education, and he is genuinely hopeful that by raising critical consciousness for the purposes of perpetual cultural revolution, eventually all, quote, dehumanizing forms can be denounced and cast down dialectically and through praxis, that is, by Marxist activism. This view is the basis for his autobiographical 1992 book, Pedagogy of Hope, where critical hope is meant to be the educational method and opportunity. In these things, Freire is unabashedly utopian in his disposition. Now, Freire's utopianism is not the kind of utopianism that envisions a perfected world and works to make it. The critical Marxism, or critical theory, or neo-Marxism era through the middle of the 20th century, had rightly completely abandoned that hope and ambition. For Freire, to have a vision of the world the way you want to see it is to eventually seize power and impose it upon people, which he defines as being intrinsically right-wing and thus not liberating or genuinely utopian. Though he doesn't say so explicitly, he seems to be laying this charge upon Lenin and Stalin and the failure of the USSR and perhaps also on Fidel Castro in Cuba, whom he does mention. In place of Lenin and Stalin, he points to the direction of the ongoing cultural revolution in China under Mao Zedong and after. And as more effective than Fidel Castro, he points to the murderous guerrilla Che Guevara, whom he holds up as an ideal avatar of utopianism, hope, and love, and thus also as a fitting role model for educators and their students. Though to be fair, he says Guevara's specific witness might not be appropriate in other contexts than his own. Of course, that witness is going around and murdering people. Maybe not appropriate for teachers. That's all he <laughs> really has to say that. Like the critical Marxist Herbert Marcuse, to whom Freire was a contemporary, and of whom he was a reader, Freire's utopianism is negative utopianism, a somewhat unfamiliar point of view. In negative utopianism, the goal isn't to articulate or envision some idealized society and work to make it. Instead, it is to believe the ideal society is already contained within the existing society, but needs to be liberated from the dehumanizing forms that prevent its emergence. Negative utopianism, therefore, is utopian in the sense that it believes the perfect world, or as we heard, the kingdom of God on earth, is already present but has to be freed up from or recollected from the oppressive, repressive, unjust world of structural power dynamics. It can only be freed up by ruthless criticism of all that exists, to quote Marx, and this is precisely what Freire advocates. 
His process is a little more than arriving at critical consciousness, which he calls conscientization, and then engaging in a process of denouncing all so-called dehumanizing structures. If this denunciation, aka critique, is done from a conscientized position, that is, as a critical Marxist, the denunciation will automatically announce the possibility and direction of a more humanizing possibility. I guess I should put world there, shouldn't I? Let's just do that so we don't lose it. Freire's and Marcuse's utopianism of this is of this kind. So let me just break that down for you again. There's what you might call positive utopianism, which is that you envision the world you want to have, and then you try to make it happen. And what Freire and Marcuse agree upon, and Freire is very insistent upon, and he kind of blames the Soviet Union for attempting, is that if you envision the perfect world and you try to force people into it, you're just going to be a dictator and a nightmare. You're going to be intrinsically right-wing. You're going to intrinsically do damage. You're going to be not liberatory. You're not actually going to be left-wing, emancipatory, liberatory, or even Marxist, frankly. That's positive utopianism. If you envision the perfect world, if you're going to try to build God's kingdom on earth on purpose, knowing what you think it's supposed to look like, you're going to be a tyrant. So that's what the critical Marxists absolutely denounce. What Marcuse and Ferreri believe in is something that we would call negative utopianism, which is that if you just denounce everything wrong in the world, and Max Horkheimer came along to this view too, if you just denounce everything wrong in the world, then what you're going to do is get rid of all the wrong stuff, and the ideal kingdom of God society is actually contained inside, and will be able to blossom and flourish and grow out of the spaces in which it's constrained. you got to think of it like that the seed of of utopia, the seed of of Eden, of the Garden of Eden, is planted inside of our society, and it's struggling to break out, but it's trapped in something like concrete, or rock, or muck, or evil, or really structural power dynamics that advantage certain groups. Literally, that's what it's trapped in, is structural power dynamics. And if you criticize the that which creates those dynamics, and you break apart those structural power dynamics or the concrete, or the rock, or whatever, then that seed will blossom, or will, 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 will germinate and grow, and then eventually blossom, and you end up with the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and the fruit of the tree of life, and you're back in Eden. And I want to remind you that Herbert Marcuse, although I didn't mention any of this here, in his book, Eros and Civilization, in 1955, said that the purpose of his critique was to enter back into Eden, by taking a second bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So when I say that Freire's and Marcuse's utopianism is of this negative kind, what it is is that if you find what's wrong in the world, the dehumanizing structures, or as Max Horkheimer said, the things that we want to criticize, that we don't like, and you critique them from within a position of consciousness, meaning Marxist consciousness, then you announce the possibility of that seed of the ideal society germinating or growing, or blossoming. Now, I say, nota bene, this is to say that Freire's and Marcuse's utopianism is hermetic in its underlying beliefs and structure. That is, the divine can be realized only by freeing it from the mundane, in which it is trapped as a consequence of the hermetic act of creation. The process of freeing the divine from the mundane in the hermetic mystery religion is called alchemy. So it's an alchemical process. If you don't know, the very, very short version of this hermetic belief is that when God creates the world in order to create, God co-creates the world in himself in the same instant is the way that they have their creation myth. And God, in creating the world, traps his divine essence in everything, in the, in the mundane world that he creates at the same time. And what the hermeticist, what the alchemist, what the spiritual advanced seeker is supposed to do is go around and do the alchemical process to free the divine from the mundane so that the divine aspects can get out and recollect together into uh, the ideal form. And then at that point, the deity will realize itself to be a perfect deity. There will be no separation between um, from man and God, etc., and we're back in business as far as, like, kind of, you know, access to the divine realm goes. 
This is the basic hermetic view. If you want to think about it, gold is the divine metal. It has to be freed up from lead. So you have to do the alchemical process on the base metal in order to get the seed of gold inside to be freed so it can blossom and grow. Marcuse is saying literally the same thing about society, and so is Freire. Or you could, what's the other big thing from alchemy is the elixir of life. Death is the mundane form, and if you just had access to figure out how to transmute death into for eternal life, then you would do that by creating the elixir of life. You'd free up the divine, which is living, from the dead, which is your material body. And all kinds of views as to what the elixir might be uh, could be thought up, whether that's literal eternal life or whether that's some kind of spiritual uh, eternal life. But anyway, what I'm saying is that Freire and Marcuse have adopted a fully hermetic negative utopian view that if we tear apart the dehumanizing structures as Marxism sees it, as cultural Marxism sees it, in the world today, remember that Freire wasn't just a Marxist, he was also a post-colonialist, so he cared a lot about things like race, about like invading powers, imperialism, and so on. But if we could just free, if we could just criticize all the dehumanizing structures out of existence, racism, sexism, classism, blah, 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 just dehumanize, criticize all of them out of existence, and what's left is the idea, the seed of the ideal society, which could grow and fill in all the spaces, and we end up in a socialist utopia. And that's literally alchemy, literally alchemy at the socio-cultural level, and that's kind of what the Marxist religion is. And this is what Freire is waking back up with his rampant negative utopianism. Okay, long sidebar. Thus, for Freire, I say, the key aspect of his program is conscientization, which he has in Portuguese as conscientiza chau, which is the awakening of critical consciousness. By the way, if we're looking at this as a hermetic religion, what that means is basically going through the priestly transformation. You're becoming uh, a member of the faith, the, a member of the, the alchemists who are able to transform society through denunciation that turns into annunciation. You denounce the existing forms of the world to announce a possible better form of the world. You Conscientization is the process of joining the alchemy cult. That's literally what it is. Okay? Literally what it is. But it's the awakening of critical consciousness. How did Freire get these ideas? Well, following the Hungarian Marxist, George Lukács, who identified that, above all, class consciousness is educable. That's how. Freire focused on education because the relevant consciousness, as Lukács laid out, is something you can teach people. So following the Hungarian Marxist, George Lukács, who identified that above all, class consciousness is educable, Freire devised a method of political education posing as real education that performs the necessary conscientization using whatever academic curriculum as a, quote, mediator to knowledge. In other words, to conscientization, which is joining the cult, which is becoming an alchemist, a Marxist alchemist. For his part, Lukács, who most famously wrote History and Class Consciousness in 1923, tried to bridge the gap between Marx's insistence that the proletariat would rise up, which it did not do at the relevant time in the late 1910s and early 1920s, if it was sufficiently class conscious. Lukács, as a result, determined that there are different stages of consciousness preceding full class consciousness and then eventual true communist consciousness, and was trying to sort out how to educate people into class consciousness. For his work in this endeavor, he was appointed Deputy Commissar of Education in the short-lived Hungarian Soviet Republic in 1919 under Béla Kun. Though he wasn't so specific about the stages and didn't finally discretize them, Lukács's model of establishing consciousness recognized that people first needed to be made aware of their class status, then they had to be taught what that class status means, and what it means is oppression. The nature of oppression as structural within a greater whole then has to be communicated, and following that, the essential dialectical view of the oppressed as a historical subject has to be raised. Only after these understandings had been taught could someone understand that the underclass can only truly affect true historical change through class solidarity, this power otherwise being reserved for the overclass. This is the final realization of class consciousness. So let me summarize Lukács' view to class consciousness. 
First, you have to make people aware that they're in a class society and in a class. Then you have to make them be made aware that this is a situation that oppresses them. Then you have to make them aware that the oppression is a structural phenomenon involving the whole of society. It's not just how it is. It's not the haves and have-nots. It's a system of haves and have-nots that interact together. And when that's understood, you have to uh, convince them that there is, in fact, a dialectical process in this greater whole that society is transforming and that the underclass plays a role in it. Once they understand that the underclass plays a role in the transformation of history out of an oppressive state that they find themselves in, then they can be taught that they have to think as a class to gain political power. That's what it means to be in the underclass. To be in the overclass means you can do things, and if you make a big splash, you change history all on your own. To be in the underclass, you don't have that power. You're silenced, you're oppressed, you're marginalized, you're disenfranchised, whatever it is. So you have to come together as a a block, a political block in class solidarity. That's class consciousness. When you realize that if you come together in a block in class solidarity, and you realize that that class makes history if it acts as a block, and you realize that it is the block that is in a system of oppression that involves both the oppressors and the oppressed, and it dehumanizes everybody, then you have the possibility of generating a revolutionary class, which is called class consciousness, like I said. He then finishes, this is Lukács, Lukács then finishes his discourse on the issue in history and class consciousness, this is specifically the third chapter of the book, by pointing out that class consciousness will ultimately reproduce class society unless the proletariat wins the final battle, which is against itself. True Marxist consciousness will never arise, believed Lukács, unless the proletariat also destroyed itself, and with it, class society altogether. This concurred with Marx's view that true communism arrives only with the total transcendence of private property, thus transcendence of human self-estrangement, and thus the dissolution of class society altogether. So do you see the problem here? That you have to have class solidarity, you have to think in terms of social classes, and then you're supposed to seize all the power and overthrow everything, but you already think in terms of social classes, so when you seize power... You still think in terms of social classes because you're still caught in class conditioning. And so you just reproduce a new class society. Mm -hmm. This is very important to understand as to what 20th century Marxism is actually about. That view is crucial to understand, to understand what 20th century Marxism is about. So at the end of the third chapter of History and Class Consciousness, George Lukács explains that the final battle of the proletariat is to destroy itself, thus overcoming class entirely. That's supposed to happen at the end of the dictatorship of the proletariat somehow. Lenin had ideas, never worked out. Stalin had ideas, really didn't work out. Maybe China's doing it. Maybe so is the WEF, World Economic Forum, who knows. In the years between 1923 and 1968, so in other words, from History and Class Consciousness publication until Freire finished his first manuscript of Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Lukács' program had not generally succeeded in creating movements on behalf of workers or others among the oppressed, although the post-colonial liberation movements had seen some success. That's an aside. And Lukács' focus on class consciousness specifically was seen by critical Marxists like Freire as too limited. Again, because the post-colonialists were having some success. Recall, Freire started his activism and educational model as a post-colonialist, not as a classical Marxist. Freire, like the other critical Marxists, like Marcuse, saw class consciousness as incapable of producing the cultural revolution they sought and lusted after, seeing the success of Mao Zedong in China. Societies tend to reproduce themselves. That's the conclusion especially through education, a point that critical Marxists, especially in education theory, referred to as the problem of reproduction. Freire was setting out to extend Lukács' graduated, educable program of conscientization into and beyond the critical Marxist limit. 
So this is what led Max Horkheimer, by the way, to say we can't envision the ideal society. All we can do is criticize the society that uh, the, the aspects of this society that we don't like. This is what he said, what he meant when he said that they devised the critical theory in 1937 in the first place. He specifically did in order to deal with the problem that you cannot actually articulate the view of the good society from within the existing society because the terms of the existing society already reproduce class society. So you have to be able to step out of those terms, but that's impossible, which leaves for you only one tool, which is relentless critique. The, 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 the critical Marxists never really figured out the formula. Marcuse got very, very close. Horkheimer and Adorno as kind of the two by mid-century remaining big-time guys. I mean, we have Eric Fromm with this biophiliac, necrophiliac crap, and some other guys too, but the ten of big, big names in, in the Frankfurt School by, might say, 1955, 1960-ish, are going to be Horkheimer and Adorno outside of Herbert Marcuse. And so Horkheimer and Adorno had more or less given up. Adorno has this whole negative view of utopianism and this whole thing. They've more or less given up on the idea of, of seeing things in a utopian light, but Marcuse didn't. Marcuse saw the hope. Marcuse saw the idea that relentless critique could, un this hermetic hope, that you could unleash the, the um, better society from within the existing society through critique. Freire saw the same thing, and he realized that the key was to use conscientization, which is bringing people into the alchemy cult, and the way that to, to conscientize is by hijacking education. Lukács thought consciousness was educable in stages. Freire thought consciousness is going to be educable in more stages. Same stages plus more stages because critical consciousness has to supplant class consciousness. Class consciousness is going to reproduce class society. Critical consciousness is relentless of, relentlessly critical of the idea of class society at all. So it's the proletariat trying to overcome itself. See what I'm talking about? Freire took it a couple, uh, another step further than that to what I call utopian consciousness, as we'll carry on. Thus, the Freirean model picks up from class consciousness and extends it into critical consciousness, if it doesn't bypass class consciousness altogether. See, if you're working in post-colonial theory or critical race theory or queer theory or gender theory or feminism, you don't actually need class consciousness. You can actually skip it. Or you don't have to, or you can draw upon it, or you can dialectically mix it in a little bit. But it might by, it might bypass it altogether and go straight into critical consciousness. It might use class consciousness as a way station if it's more economic and material in its, its analysis. Either way, critical consciousness is the belief that the very terms upon which society is defined and communicated are set up to reproduce its existing forms, and thus that a better or ideal society cannot even be expressed in the limited terms of the existing society. Stepping outside of the existing paradigm, which critical Marxists view as totalizing, is not possible. However, except in that it creates windows for discovering and critiquing those aspects of the existing society that we do not like. Again, quoting Max Horkheimer here. So you can't step out, but you can see the problems. You can't step out of the existing society, but you can emotionally gain critical distance, and then you can see the problems and critique them as though you have that emotional outsider status. Doesn't that seem familiar? Freire then extends the need for developing critical consciousness that the very terms of the existing society and any dehumanizing form or structure that can be identified within it must be critiqued in a neo-Marxist way and extends it into future societies as well. The problem of reproduction to Freire is subtle, and the issue Lukács identified that class consciousness will tend to, re, uh, to produce a new class society is significant and perhaps insurmountable, at least through any single revolution. Freire therefore prescribes that critical consciousness engenders a revolution sorry, that as critical consciousness engenders a revolution, the need for critical consciousness increases. So you don't have your critical consciousness, have your revolution, and spread your critical consciousness, I should say, then have your revolution, and then, ta-da, welcome to the woke utopia. No, that's not how it works. That's a step toward accountability. We're nowhere near justice yet. 
You've heard those words before. AOC said those words. She said, when Derek Chauvin was found guilty on three counts regarding George Floyd, she said within 10 minutes of the verdict, this was not justice. This was accountability. It's a single action of accountability. So Freire prescribes that as critical consciousness engenders a revolution, the need for critical consciousness increases. Cultural revolution isn't a singular event for Freire, but a perpetual state if one is truly to denounce dehumanizing forms of all sorts without letting them get established into a new mode of oppression. Parenthetically, I say this view he likely derived, given his writings, from seeing Latin American countries be liberated from oppressive rulers by outside forces or internal guerrillas only to install new and worse regimes in the vacuum. So this need for perpetually increasing criticality in one's consciousness I refer to as Frarian utopian consciousness, which Herbert Marcuse was just one step short of defining for himself. In fact, Marcuse talks about it all the time. He talks about utopian this, utopian that, through negative thinking. And so it's his negative thinking, relentless critique. Freire was much more explicit about what that looks like, what it requires, what it means, than Marcuse was. The pedagogy of hope at the center of Freire's project, then, is allowing faith that this intrinsically negative process will dialectically achieve a true communist and socially just society if pursued with sufficient interest and commitment to denouncing every so-called dehumanizing context. So this this is the centerpiece of the faith that is the hope that Freire gives, that if we just keep denouncing everything, utopia will arrive eventually. And when you think you've got your revolution, you have to denounce that too. So let's say that you have your revolution in your school and you install social-emotional learning. Well, it's not systemic social-emotional learning, or it leaves out something, or leaves out, you know, whatever it happens to be, or it doesn't address whether or not hamburgers are, are contributing to climate change. You have to take another step immediately. So you have to denounce whatever you achieve immediately. Maybe social-emotional learning wasn't systemic. Maybe social-emotional learning is systemic, but it's actually not delivering because it's being co-opted by some ed tech company. These things are actually being said. Maybe companies have installed their ESG, but they're not. we're not getting the world that they expected out of installing ESG, so it must be that the companies are woke-washing or whitewashing. They're faking their E and their S score so that they can get uh, credit without actually doing the work. And if you take up the activism, of course, you didn't do it right, and you have to do the work. You have to continue to denounce, to denounce, to denounce, to denounce, and the faith is that if you do this forever, you get to utopia. As a pedagogy, the pedagogy of hope would say to let that utopian hope be the teacher and a guide to relentless critique and perpetual struggle for ultimate liberation. This is a religious eschatological view in the religion of Marxism, by the way. And it's also why Freire is its revivalist. Possessing something akin to this utopian consciousness is in one sense the meaning of being woke. Turning education into a process to awaken woke utopian consciousness is the heart of the Freirean project. And it follows from what I term a Freirean Marxification of education. Shameless plug, I'm going to publish a book by that very title, The Marxification of Education, about Paulo Freire, pretty soon. Freire's views of education follow almost entirely from the starting point of a fatalistic, critical Marxist view on the problem of reproduction, and then chart a path out of that fatalism in this pedagogy of hope in utopian consciousness. The problem of reproduction, rightly viewed, however, erects a Marxian theory of being educated, being literate, being a knower, and thus of knowledge itself. And that's apart from the postmodern project of deconstructing the legitimacy of claims to knowledge. It is this view that Freire adopted, which I refer to as his, quote, Marxification of education. And that led to his notion of utopian conscientization as a potential alchemical faith-based solution to the problem of reproduction. Now, I'll give you an aside. It crafted into the postmodernism that the post-structural feminists were importing into English departments 
very, very effectively, because they both had different critiques of what it means to be a knower and why it's invalid that the people claiming to be knowers or knowledgeable should have to be have the ability to make that claim. In fact, Michel Foucault's kind of the essence of his project is the idea that when somebody claims that they know something or they make a knowledge claim that they're making a political statement. They're making a political statement about how they became authenticated to be a knower and what effects that claim to knowledge has out in the world in terms of social control, etc. Who gets to claim alternative things, who's crazy for trying, blah, 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 blah. His whole project can be summarized that way. Ferrari is looking at it from a slightly different angle, but it's largely the sim a similar project. But he did it from a much more Marxian angle. In short, I wrote, it is possible to view being educated, being literate, and possessing knowledge as being in possession of a special kind of private property on terms that are set by the property holders. By the way, that's Marxism right there. Marxists would view any such possession of special property and the terms of possession as being inherently rigged to the advantage of the existing property holders so as to exclude others from that overclass status while also exploiting them, perhaps by having them do manual labor to produce food and infrastructure that they can enjoy as bourgeois white-collar types. Because the educated get to decide what counts as being educated, the literate get to decide what constitutes literacy, and the knowledgeable get to decide what counts as knowledge or knowing, there's an inherent and unjust stratification of society along these lines that places people in conflict for status and resources in society. Those in the overclass not only set the terms, but also promulgate a mythology, an ideology, explaining why the world of knowing or being learned is the way it is, which naturally justifies their own advantage both to them and to members in the underclass who become fatalistic and accepting of the unjust world order. Now, here's the key difference, by the way, between Freire and the postmodernists when I said their projects are very similar, dipping off to the side. The postmodernists believed, well, let's start with Freire. Freire believed that the knowledgeable themselves create this effect. Foucault believed everybody creates the effect. So Foucault's actually gone more holistic. Uh, Foucault has abandoned the idea that there's this upper class and the lower class, and the upper class creates the ideology, and the lower class is kind of brainwashed by it. Foucault's view would be that everybody constantly through their social interactions, which are constantly shifting around and moving around and relational, everybody's constantly creating the prevailing ideology kind of together. It's the only difference. It's the only difference. Imposed from above or everybody's participating in making it. Freire's view is, in some sense, that culture and politics are actually downstream from education and who gets to be considered a knower in any given society, meaning somebody who knows. Utilizing a number of awkward puns on literacy and reading, he argues that even when the illiterate are taught to read, they are kept politically illiterate. In fact, by being educated in the existing system, they are taught to value the existing system to get a job in it and thus to prop it up while betraying those among their former peers who weren't able to do so, thus worsening the underlying problem of oppression. A true education, he posits then, is not about learning to read disconnected syllables and meaningless sentences, but in learning to read the concrete reality of the unjust contexts of the people's lives, the oppressed lives. That is, true literacy is political literacy, and actual literacy is a kind of false literacy that actually ideologizes people and steals their revolutionary potential. Following from this, Freire indicates that literacy lessons are best used as mediators to conscientization, which is the result of gaining true political literacy. Remember, that means joining the, alchemy, the Marxist alchemy cult. That means, under the pretext of teaching peasants and sl slum dwellers to read, Freire is actually radicalizing them into a Marxist consciousness. His pedagogy of the oppressed is, in fact, this conscientization process. In practice today, the heavy reliance on Freirean pedagogy is why American school children are failing abysmally at academic competencies, but are increasingly leftist and radical. 
Their school lessons have been replaced with political literacy lessons that use the academic content as a mere mediator to radicalization. In other words, their education has been stolen from them by Marxists who want to use them to get their revolutions. Now that we understand something of the Frarian mindset and project, we can examine his specific pedagogical method. As it turns out, it appears very complicated on the surface, but is in fact extremely simple. It contains five key points. The dialogical model versus the banking model of education. The use of generative themes. A process of codification and lesson planning. A process of decodification and conscientization. And finally, an invitation into praxis through enunciation and denunciation, as indicated above. The first piece of his model is the so-called dialogical model of education, for which Freire is regrettably probably most famous. It is, in my opinion, the least important of the pieces of his pedagogy. Freire, drawing off Socrates while saying he did it all wrong in the politics of education, insists that for education to be true education, and for it to be dialectical, which is to, to be read as Marxist, it must be based upon dialogue, not lecture and instruction. Moreover, to avoid reproducing the power dynamics of a class society, it must also feature dialogue between educators and learners as equals. Freire prefers they not be called teachers and students for this reason, but he's rarely strict about it. Teachers are people who, quote, who know, while students are people, quote, who do not know, which establishes the problem of reproduction. Educators and learners are equals in Freire's so-called democratic classrooms, though the educators have the role of facilitators, which isn't, to, which, uh, which isn't to be mistaken, I always put a little sarcasm, which isn't to be mistaken for, say, programmers or groomers. Freire contrasts this democratic dialogical approach to learning, where educators and learners learn and conscientize together, against a straw man of education he calls the banking model of education. Education, or schooling as we usually think of it, claims Freire operates like a bank. The students are like deposit boxes and the teachers have knowledge they deposit into the students. The students can then take that knowledge capital and capitalize upon it or not, which enables them to be successful in the existing society, which they'll then maintain, defend, and reproduce as a result. In the dialogical model, educators and learners are supposed to learn, which is to say conscientize, which actually means radicalize, together. As it turns out, the dialogical approach therefore reproduces almost identically the educational approach applied under Mao Zedong in the early days of the CCP in China specifically reproducing the, quote, struggle unit model. Struggle would be, uh, see if I can remember the Chinese, um, Dojang. In those settings, both brainwashing, Xinao, in both prisons and schools, a peer learning model was used in which learners at varying levels worked together to encourage each other and, quote, help one another study more deeply into what was called the people's standpoint, which is an obvious parallel to the standpoint of the oppressed. The goal was mutual facilitation and a greater conscientization of the people's standpoint, which was the Marxist consciousness encouraged by Mao and the CCP. Surely, it is only a coincidence that Freire and his chief evangelist Henry Drew refer to the goal of conscientization as entering into, quote, perpetual struggle alongside the oppressed. The dialogical model, you, let me just elaborate on that prison point a minute. What would happen in these prisons is you'd be stuck into a prison so that you'd go to Mao prison or within the school it was structured the same way. You'd have a study group. In the prison, it was your cell group, your cellmates. You'd have about eight of them, or ten of them. And those people would relentlessly harass and bully you into wanting to recognize the world or your crimes, depending on if you're in school or prison, from the standpoint of the people, from the people's standpoint. They wanted to help you want to see it by bullying you and berating you and holding you socially accountable very strictly and making your life generally miserable 
if you didn't conform, kind of like hanging out with woke people is today. They join your club, they ruin everything, and basically what they're doing is creating kind of um, non-centralized struggle groups. And the people who everybody leaves, <laughs> but you can't leave in a prison and you couldn't leave in a Chinese school. And then you had this other fact of, of your experience that was interrogation where your so-called judges or the teachers would interrogate you or test you or quiz you to find out whether or not you had adopted the perspective sufficiently and then to guide further struggle sessions among those that were senior to you in the study groups. This is exactly the kind of project-based learning and uh, so-called democratic classroom stuff that goes under Frarian model and the um, relentless social critiquing of one another, mean girl bullying of one another is indicative of the struggle model that was being used by the communists in China in prisons and in schools in order to bring people into the so-called people standpoint, which is to say Marxist consciousness. In other words, the process of conscientization. So literally, Freire's method is the same as the Maoist uh, brainwashing method. Literally the same, except that it's tucked within um, actual education. It's hidden within education instead of being overt. The dialogical model is used throughout all of the Freirean pedagogy, which proceeds in three definite steps. Gathering generative themes, presenting and decodifying the codified themes, and then allegedly actual education. In experiments on implementing the Frarian approach, the third of these steps is rarely, if ever, reached. Students are so radicalized by the first steps that they become, quote, emotional wrecks, who not only don't want to learn to read, but also see no point in reading at all, often turning on the so called facilitators as, part, as being part of the deep existential problem in their lives. That is, in summary, the Frarian model works for conscientizing, which is radicalizing, but it does so at the expense of achieving its selling point, which is actual enhanced education, through high engagement and interest. It's good to remember that Freire considers the academic content a mere mediator to the radicalization before concluding that this outcome represents a failure of the Frarian method as opposed to it doing what it is actually designed to do, whatever intentions or claims about the intentions are given alongside it, to sell it. By the way, the usual claim is, if you get people politically engaged, they'll be more engaged, then they'll want to learn, and then they'll learn. Turns out it doesn't work. You radicalize the people, and they don't want to learn. They want to be activists. They want to do praxis. To begin with this process, the dialogical model is used primarily for a 1960s and 1970s tech mode of information gathering or data mining the students about their concrete realities of the context of their lives. This enables the generative three themes approach. Let me say that again. This enables the generative themes approach that Freire advocates absolutely. A generative theme is a theme in the learner's lives to be discovered by a Frarian educator through dialogue, or in the 21st century, direct device-enabled data mining, including surveys. The goal is to find 17, and I don't know the reason, that's what Frary said, the goal is to find 17 themes that have emotional, social, and political relevance to the structural injustices allegedly experienced by the learners in their everyday lives. These themes will be fed back to the learners by the educators as facilitators to increase their interest in learning. That's the generative themes approach. The key in the Frarian approach is that the generative themes meet two primary criteria. They must match the actual contexts of the lives of the learners, and they must be emotionally engaging on politically relevant topics. Of course, engaging here is a euphemism. The themes are carefully selected entry points for radicalization. They are points of soreness or inflammation or grievance by which learners can be radicalized by their facilitators into a Marxist view of those very inflaming conditions that were first drawn out of them through the dialectical approach. Proceeding with academic teaching from generative themes therefore constitutes the first big step in the Frarian theft of education. 
Once the dialogical themes are extracted, the lesson plans around them are organized by the educator as facilitator. These lesson plans involve what Freire called codifications of the generative themes, as in co coding them, turning them into codes. A codification of a generative theme is an abstract depiction of that theme, usually pictorial in form, if teaching literacy, as the students cannot yet read. Okay, so let me summarize where we're going so far. Frarian method so far is talk to the people, gather, use that as a data mining device. It could include surveys and wearable tech today, and does, but you talk to the people, somehow data mine the people, gather the generative themes that are politically radical, radicalizing kind of points of, of uh, I don't know, sensitivity that the people, the things that are likely to radicalize students if you poke, it's like a sore spot. If you keep poking it, it will radicalize somebody. So you, anyway, you talk to the people, you gather the things that will inflame them or that will radicalize them. Then you package them up. So, so far you've been talking to the students to get the ideas that will inflame them. Now the teacher goes off by themselves and creates lesson plans of codifications of those generative themes, which is an abstract depiction of that theme. And again, usually if you're doing literacy, pictorial in form. The goal of the codification is to present some radicalizing generative theme in a sufficiently abstract way that the learners will gain what Freire calls critical distance from what is being presented. For what it's worth, Drag Queen Story Hour presents itself academically as a generative approach to quote living queerly to young children. The 1619 Project intr introduces generative themes to critical race theory. Comprehensive sexuality education presents generative themes of sex, gender, and sexuality. So-called decolonized curricula exist to replace existing curricula, uh, sorry, replace existing culturally anchoring curriculum elements with generative curricula for any of the above forms of identity Marxism. Again, recall that Freire began his work as a post-colonialist, so it's worth noting that because the decolonization of the curriculum thing is based in his work, and that's thanks to a critical pedagogue named Joe L. Kinchelo, that's K-I-N-C-H-E-L-O-E, -E, if you want to look him up, who also identified and described critical constructivist epistemology, which is the formal academic term that actually means woke. So if you wondered if Freire's method means woke, yes, because it's the basis for critical constructivist epistemology at the heart of his pedagogy. So that's what conscientization brings you into, critical constructivist ways of knowing. When you are a critical constructivist, you are woke. That's what woke means. Joe Kinchelo extended specifically from Ferrari to create not only this, but also the decolonizer curriculum program based in Ferrari. There you go. Why? Because he's post-colonialist. Mm -hmm. So-called culturally relevant teaching is, in fact, the Freirean generative themes approach repackaged into multicultural education, ethnic studies, and or critical race theory. So the goal of culturally relevant teaching, the way you are culturally relevant or demonstrate cultural competence, is that you're going to engage with the culture of the class, ethnic cultures specifically, to find generative themes, and then you're going to package them up and deliver them in a shape that looks like critical race theory, multicultural education, or ethnic studies. It's the same damn thing. Gloria Ladson Billings isn't a genius. She's basically a plagiarist. After the codifications of the generative themes are prepared, a multi-step process of decodification, decoding the political content of those themes, takes place. Okay, so let me summarize the big picture again so we don't get lost. Talk to the students to get their idea, to, to data mine them for what will radicalize them. Identify what will radicalize them. That's gener find the generative themes. Freire says 17 of them for whatever reason. Step three is that you are then, as the teacher, going to go create codifications, abstract depictions of those themes that you're going to then use as your lessons to feed back to the students. Okay, then you begin a process called decodification. So you talk 
then you find the generative themes, then you codify them, and then you come back to the students after you've codified them. That's not something you do together. You come back and you take your codified themes, which might be books about the subjects, it might be the 1619 project material, whatever it is, it might be a drag queen. You bring this stuff into the classroom and you're going to begin to decodify. And so the main part of the Frarian education is talk to gather the themes, identify the themes, encode the themes, deliver the encoded themes so that you can start to decodify them. And that's the key. So after the codifications of the generative themes are prepared, a multi-step process of decodification of those themes takes place. Actually, in fact, here's where the second step in the Frarian theft of education really takes place. And here's the trick. It's because there isn't one decodification process happening, there are two at once. In practice, only one actually happens. And that's the path to conscientization and radicalization. In other words, one of the decodifications is linguistic, the other is political. I really want you to let that sink in for a second. Before I proceed, this is the key to understanding the trick. We've already got the idea of stealing education by stealing its content, by turning it into generative themes and presenting it in this way. Here's how it works. The goal is to do a political education in order to increase interest in the actual education. The decodification, if you read Ferrari, has two things going on at once, but they're blended so smoothly that it's hard to see that there are two things at once. One of them is a political decodification of their circumstances. In other words, teaching them to read it as a Marxist. The other is a literal decodification of the image into a word into a literacy lesson. So one is linguistic. That's the selling point that never works. The other is political. That's the radicalization process. You need to be clear that that's what's happening. The way that the theft of education from Paulo Ferreri works is in two big steps. Number one, that you do it through a culturally relevant way by data mining, finding the generative radicalizing themes, packaging them up, and then engaging in this process. So you are going to use the generative themes approach to turn knowledge into, to, to turn the lesson, math, reading, whatever, into a mediator for the political conversation. Then the second step is that you're going to have two decodifications happening at once where one is real and one is fake. Magic always involves a misdirection. The misdirection is to get you to look at the idea that this is a reading lesson or a math lesson that's just being taught in a culturally competent way, where what's really happening, the sleight of hand, is that the political education is what's happening. And it radicalizes to the point where, in experiment, Nobody actually wants to learn to read afterwards, and the people turn into emotional wrecks because they're so heavily radicalized. Okay, now let's carry on. Freire describes the process. Sorry, let's just start that sentence again. Freire describes the two processes of decodification in tandem, but it is helpful to separate them. I think it's absolutely key. As many times as I've read Freire, it took me this long to see it. So Freire describes these two, linguistic and political, processes of decodification in tandem. In fact, in the, I think, seventh chapter or sixth chapter, seventh, one, one or the other, at the, at the end of the chapter in Politics of Education, he has an appendix on the actual decodification process, and he puts it out in five steps. In the five steps, it turns out, don't make any sense compared to what you're actually reading, and it takes you a long time to figure out that what it is, is he's mixing the two different types of decodification into one list. Okay. The two processes of decodification need to be separated. The linguistic decodification proceeds as follows. The codified theme, that's your abstract picture of whatever it is, is portrayed by one means or another, pictorial in a strict Freirean approach. The image is then discussed using the dialogical approach, including its political relevance. Daha. This is the point at which the political decodification actually begins, but we will bracket that for the moment to walk through the Freirean lie that actually steals education from our students. Once the learners understand the image of the codification, the generative word that gave rise to that theme and codification is shown with the image. 
Again, remember, he was teaching adult literacy, so it's important to remember that. Say that the concept was a slum or racism. An image of that situation, slums or racism, in the abstract is shown and discussed. Then the word is added to the image. So they're seeing a depiction of a slum, they're seeing a depiction of racism, and then the word slum or the word racism appears. Slum in Brazilian is favela. An image of that situation is shown and discussed, and then the word is added to the image. The reading lesson that linguistically decodifies the image and initiates the reading process is supposed to be enhanced by the political decodification that entered in by increasing interest and engagement. Learners are supposed to focus on learning to read the word that they associate with the image, however, and then use what they learn by reading to read that word to begin to decodify the language, aha, linguistic decodification, by learning other words that are linguistically related to it, phonetically or syllabically, etc. Now, let me pause before I carry on to the political part to let me just walk through. It's hard to do this without giving the example that Freire gives, which is favela in Portuguese. And so what he says is that we're going to show a picture of the slum, the favela, and then what we're going to do when people are looking at the favela is that we're going to put the word, we're going to get, we're going to discuss what it is. This is a slum, and you're going to talk about the political context. What is it like to live in a slum? Why is it like that? How did it get this way? Who's, who's responsible? You have a little political conversation to get people really interested in the idea of slum life, and even how slum life relates to them. And then, pop, you add the word favela. And you say, this thing that you're now very interested in is this slum, this favela, has this word associated with it. And now the people are very interested. And they're like, ah, oh, favela. And they're supposed to see favela. Three-syllable word for Ferrari, by the way. And in addition to choosing 17 words in Portuguese, you should always choose 17 three-syllable words for reasons that have to do with the syllabic structure of Portuguese that don't apply in English. So it might be slum might be suffering, it might be misery, it might be dying, it might be death, uh, it might be racism, it might be a lot of things. Okay, but in Portuguese, what you would do to start linguistically decodifying po Portuguese is you would take the syllables fa, ve, la, and you would look at their family, their syllabic families. Fa is F-A, but it could be F-E or F-I or F-O or F-U. So it could be fa or fe or fi or fo or f. And then you look at Ve, V-E, but it could be va or ve or va, vi, I'm sorry, V, I guess, v, I don't know, V-I, or vo or v, V-U. Or then you look at la, it could be la or le or li or lo or lu. And then you have five times five times five, it's 125 different words that you can build out of those syllables just all alone. And allegedly, this teaches people to read Portuguese words because they recognize one syllable, they look at how syllables sound similar, how they might be spelled, and then they can start to explore other words and learn to read those other words by sight. It seems like a really backwards-ass way to learn reading, frankly, because it's based on syllables and stuff, but maybe it works in Portuguese. Obviously, it wouldn't work in English, but that doesn't stop them. At any rate, the process, to summarize it again, is... You introduce the codification, so you first you, you do the dialogue, then you learn the generative themes, then you identify the generative themes and codify them, then you give these images of the codified themes, and the decodification begins. If we took Frarians at their word, what would happen is the culturally relevant education would begin. And what would happen is you'd give the culturally relevant idea or image or concept or rap song or whatever it is, and then you would use that as a mediator to a literacy lesson. They would learn to identify the way that you do that to get the interest and engagement up first is you make it a political discussion about the concept and the codification, the abstract image of whatever situation you know will radicalize them when they understand it. And you have the political decodification actually takes place there, but we've bracketed it and skipped it. After the political codif decodification occurs, you, are, you actually will do the linguistic decodification. The way the linguistic decodification will go at that point is that you're going to break, you're going to show them the word that relates to the thing that's now radicalized them, and you're going to get them excited about learning to read the word that radicalized them so they can learn more about it and learn to speak the word that proclaims the world about it. And once that happens, then you're going to use that 
to induce a literacy lesson based on how that word is spelled or pronounced or syllables or phonics or whatever else, and then people will learn to read it. Or it might be a statistics lesson. You do a statistics, you introduce a codified notion of racism through a statistics problem, you have the uh, work on the problem to learn the statistics, and then you talk about how racism is so important, then you can give them more examples, and you do the same political literacy lesson tucked into the statistical lesson and then allegedly people are going to want to learn statistics so they can learn more about the thing that they're now radicalized over, which is racial injustice, which is what you dug out of them or just assumed using critical race theory would be there. Okay, so now you've got an idea of the process. The political decodification proceeds as a matter of dialogue. Now remember, it takes place at the beginning of the linguistic decodification. You show the codification, then you have the political dialogue, then you're supposed to do the linguistic decodification that leads to learning to read. So we are, if we broke it down into stages that actually happen in the classroom in order, although everything's going to be fluid and they're floppy ass critical theory classrooms with no structure or order, if we put it in a, in a linear order, what you're going to have is present the codification, talk about it politically, so do the political decodification, then allegedly that inspires the in interest and engagement, and then you do the use that to create the linguistic decodification, okay? The political decodification proceeds as a matter of dialogue around the codified image before presenting the word for the image, so before the linguistic decodification. And thus, or sorry, and then throughout the linguistic process. So if you keep doing the linguistic process, you can continue to decodify politically. Now, again, I have to hasten to note, if that linguistic decodification process even occurs, political discussions tend to overwhelm the interest and consume all of the learning time in practice with these things. Culturally relevant teaching doesn't work. It gets people having a bunch of culturally relevant, which is radical, woke bullshit conversations instead of actually doing whatever the lesson is underneath it. Nevertheless, the political decodification proceeds in three discrete stages. This is why it seems so complicated. It's not complicated. If we put it all in order, the stages would be that you have the you will skip all the way to the codification, you package them up, you present the codification, and then you do three stages of political decodification, and then you do a couple more stages of linguistic decodification. These three discrete Political decodification stages are one, reading, that's an obvious cheap pun, two, problematizing, in case you ever wondered where that word became so common, and three, identifying or re-identification. This three-step process is supposed to facilitate conscientization about the political conditions in the image, and thus political literacy is to be achieved which will then be used to inspire actual literacy. <laughs> Does this make sense to anybody? Let's break down those stages. The reading phase of a Ferrarian political decodification is a process of learning to read the so-called structural power elements in and behind the idea in the codified image. That is, it's learning to read the political content that generates the political relevance of the generative theme, and that makes it emotionally important to the learners. Remember that there were two criteria, that it had to be emotionally relevant and it had to have political relevance? This is why. The reading phase is to get you to read the structural power that to teach you why it's political. Why do you care about this? You think this sucks, that's why I picked it as a word. You hate living in the slum, slum this, slum that, favela this, favela that. You hate racism, you experience racism, do you feel like you're going to commit suicide? You bring up these ideas, you get these ideas going generatively with the kids. Suicide, suicide, racism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, da 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 You bring it up over and over and over again. Then what you have to do is the reason that you care about this is because there's structural power behind it and it's so unjust. That's learning to read the political content that generates the political relevance of the generative theme and that makes it emotionally important to the learners. This step is the introduction of the Marxist analysis of the so-called concrete conditions learners find themselves in and the beginning of radicalization. Problematization follows, which is where those structural elements are made problematic 
in the sense of indicating a structurally relevant problem for the people they oppress. If the codification of a slum is of a slum or of racism, the reading phase would have the learners read why the slum life or racism is bad and might explore the feelings of people in those situations. What does it feel like to live in a slum? What does it feel like to experience racism? What do you think people under Jim Crow felt like? What do you think slaves felt like? The problemization phase would talk about how the slum or racism is actually structurally created and maintained by certain other people seeking to maintain their privilege and advantage in an exploitative, alienating relationship across a line of social, economic, or political stratification. It's a lot of fancy words to say all those stages of Lukács, either to culminating in class consciousness or, say, race consciousness or sex consciousness or whatever, or in general critical consciousness, all those stages, that's reading and problematization. That's the goal, is to, is to conscientize to that level at least a little bit on one issue. But remember, there are 16 more of them. The goal of the reading and problematization phases is to lead the learner through the first few stages of conscientization up to understanding the holistic and structural nature of, stro of social conditions and inducing awareness of the individual as a historical subject within those conditions. The identification or re-identification phase of the political decodification process is the true decodification of the codified generative theme, and by the way, that's where it's going to break. That's where you're going to induce emotional wrecks. It's the part where the educator as facilitator points out to the learner that the people in the codified image are the learner or people who share class identification with the learner. In other words, it's going to induce class or critical consciousness. That is, this phase of decodification is the part where the educator leads the learner to see himself on the side of the oppressed, in effect saying, the person in that horrible image we just discussed in terms of its rampant injustice is you and people like you. In experiment, this often leads to emotional breakdowns of the learners and total radicalization. They have learned to see from the perspective of the oppressed, by the way. The linguistic decodification never proceeds when the political decodification succeeds. As a model of conscientization, the Ferrarian facilitator posing as an educator will lead the radicalizing learners into one or both of class or critical consciousness, which may be social class consciousness, like racial consciousness or sex consciousness. As this process proceeds through 16, for whatever reason, more codifications, the conscientization will deepen, and the learner can be facilitated into a full utopian consciousness and thus become an inconsolable and completely ignorant cultural revolutionary of the Frarian, that is woke, type. So you do this once, you radicalize. You do this 16 times, you convince them that it's the entire world around them. And what 17 things did you do it with? 17 things in their lives that you pulled out of them through the cultural competency and relevance part of the discussion. And then you convince them that their entire world, through 17 different examples, it could be more, why not, is structured to cheat people that they are meant to be empathetic about, whether themselves, whether people who look like them or who have sex like them or whatever, or people that they are taught are um, oppressed groups that need empathy and support at all times. As an aside, Freire has merely reproduced the original form of the Hegelian dialectic with this process. Back to alchemy. Hegel framed his dialectic as abstract, negative, concrete, as opposed to Kant, who did it with uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. In the abstract, negative, concrete model, the idea we have about something is its abstracted form, which meets its negative either through a countervailing idea or by finding a contradiction in the real world, and the collision of those ideas leads to a synthetic understanding of the original idea that is more concrete thanks to its encounter with contradiction, especially when it's a practical contradiction in the world. Codification is abstracting the generative theme. The first two steps in political decodification are presenting it with its negative. Re-identification makes it concrete. It makes it personal, as a matter of fact. 
Thus conscientize, the learner is induced into praxis, which means activism, from a programmed consciousness. It can include conscientizing others as well as and through a process of critiquing every new generative theme they can find in their context. See, the learner becomes educator because there's no boundary between learner and educator. An educator is just somebody who's further along the path so they can facilitate it. In other words, they move up in the struggle session hierarchy. So your praxis might be going out and doing activism, but it's probably mostly consciousness raising, conscientizing others by using the process of critiquing. And what do you critique? You critique through reading, problematization, identification, which means that you're going to do that on every generative theme you can think of. Maybe it's gardening. Maybe it's hiking. Maybe it's math. Everywhere you look, you can find structural power and a new generative theme to a new audience, a new class of people. That's what woke does. That's why it spreads like a hyper-contagious virus. Because Ferrari Blake, uh, sorry, frames his theory ultimately as a Marxist theory of excluded knowing, literally everything can be attacked by this withering method of mindless critique, merely by latching it on to any dehumanizing structure, such as finding the hidden racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or whatever in it, and denouncing that as such, because literally everything has a body of knowledge associated with it, and thus knowers, who are regarded as knowing that knowledge, and thus outsiders who are excluded from that status. See, this is the key to the multiple different domains, racism, sexism, etc. All you have to do is look at, say, a academic department or a uh, hobby or a club or something, and you say, wow, this is mostly white people. There's a structure of racism here. Boom. Now you can say the people who created what it means to be a knower within, say, mathematics or physics or rock climbing are racist. There's a long history of racist knowledge and knowers, and it excludes other people, people of color, etc., and you've put it on the hanger of some form of structural power, and then you're off to the races. This is the denunciation aspect of the Ferrarian method, and it has the capacity to tear apart any institution, nation, activity, or society, if sufficiently ma many people are programmed into it. I recently did a podcast here explaining that all you have to do to get that to happen is create incentive structures like, I don't know, PhDs, master's degrees, um, journalism jobs, uh, faculty awards, endowed chairs, departments, blah, 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 blah. All you, all you have to do is create an entire elite, fake, universe of credentialing and rewards and prizes and, and money, and you will attract people into that. Like, I don't know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and ESG officers or something is highly paid uh, careers. And you will draw people right into it. The institution, uh, or the sorry, the incentive structures will be in place. Again, this denunciate, relentless denunciation that can be applied to anything through the idea of the group of knowers, like we talked about in a previous episode, in the Ferrarian method has the capacity to tear apart any institution, nation, activity, or society if sufficiently many people are programmed into it. And of course, every time you program anybody into it, you program them also to program more people into it. So keep that in mind. It's viral in that sense. In that regard, it's a good thing, speaking very sarcastically, that the Ferrarian method didn't completely take over our colleges of education just over 30 years ago and become the singularly dominant form of education throughout most of the Western world in the intervening time. That would be really bad for Western civilization if that had happened. As a related aside, pedagogy of the oppressed is put in pride of place in every college of education in North America, and Paulo Freire is himself the third most cited academic author across all of the humanities and social sciences having several times more citations say than the vastly more famous Albert Einstein. I dare say you've heard of him. According to Ferreri, if the critical or utopian consciousness is achieved, denunciations will take a form that automatically announces the possibility of a more socially just world. Otherwise, this is not guaranteed and will eventually generate new forms of oppression. By changing the word oppression out for the more active term repression, we see that Ferreri has created an actionable program for installing the so-called liberating tolerance that Herbert Marcuse offered in answer to what he called repressive tolerance, which is tolerance that tolerates dehumanizing conditions, so-called dehumanizing. 
We can also therefore very clearly see the world in which we inhabit and the modes in which we educate our children. As for the Frarian method, virtually every fad in contemporary education theory is either rooted in the Frarian approach or makes use of it, as we saw including Drag Queen Story Hour. Culturally relevant teaching, the other CRT, and decolonizing the curriculum are directly Frarian. Less obviously so is Transformative Social Emotional Learning, SEL, or Trans-SEL. As Linda Darling Hammond explains it in her foreword to the 2015 Handbook of Social and Emotional Learning Research and Practice, written before Transformative SEL even existed yet, to quote, As the contributors of this book show, there is a large body of scientific evidence demonstrating the positive outcomes of SEL and suggesting how these outcomes can be achieved. In the scientific foundation, sorry, this scientific foundation challenges us to undertake a decidedly humanistic endeavor. In particular, this endeavor includes the humanization of school institutions that, as Max Weber described, were deliberately depersonalized in the early 20th century in order to function as more perfect bureaucracies, guided by rules and regulations that could avoid the need for individual considerations or feelings. As Paulo Freire explained, humanization is, quote, the process of becoming more fully human as social, historical thinking, communicating, transformative, creative persons who participate in and with the world, end quote. Educators, he argued, must, quote, listen to their students and build upon their knowledge and experiences in order to engage in personalized educational approaches that further the goals of humanization and transformation. Freire cited in Salazar, 2013, page 126. I added that just to be super uh, formal about it. Indeed, Darling Hammond is going to conclude, this is what we see in schools that successfully undertake the journey of becoming socially and emotionally educative. Let me summarize what Darling Hammond just said there. What she said is that social-emotional learning is based on the idea of Frarian humanizing, humanization. It is transformative. It leads knowers to become creative persons, in other words, people who create their own reality in a historical process through critical thinking. Unambiguous social emotional learning, before it was even openly transformative in its definition, years before, was already invoking Ferrari as its destination point, just to make that really clear. Because of the ubiquity of critical pedagogy and thus the Ferrarian approach, modified and adjusted as it may be, it can be said that virtually all of our kids go to Paulo Ferrari schools with all that entails. They're mar- they're, they're Maoist re-education or thought reform prisons. That's what you're sending your kids to. Just a little editorial for you. The current trend into increasing applications of SEL, especially transformative SEL, indicates that the Frarian method will increase dramatically in all facets of education in the coming years. I'll add a PS here. Unless we stop it, which we must. Anyway. As an important additional point about the Frarian method, it isn't merely limited to education. In particular, the 10th and 11th chapters of the Politics of Education are extremely clear that every bit of the Frarian method applies in churches, seen as values imparting educational outlets, just as much as it does in education. The 10th chapter of that book, in fact, is dedicated to outlining what Frary describes as, quote, the prophetic church, the prophetic church which is essentially a church that has been retooled around a theology of the oppressed, or liberation theology, regardless of if it is Catholic, Protestant, or otherwise. Precisely the same methods and mentality described above that conquered secular education can and will conquer faith education and thus pastorship itself. And indeed, they already are. To make a final point about the Frarian approach that's relevant in many ways at once, including education, the church, and social-emotional learning in particular. While Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum does not directly praise Paulo Freire to my knowledge, the World Economic Forum itself 
has published essays on their website, now removed, that claim that the best way to teach is the Frerian method. How about that? Furthermore, a mentor of Freire, the so-called Red Bishop of Recife, Brazil, Dom Elder Camara, I think I'm saying his name more correctly now than I used to, thank you Portuguese people or Brazilian people for reaching out and telling me. Let me start that part again, though. Furthermore, a mentor of Freire, the so-called Red Bishop of Recife, Brazil, Dom Elder Camara, is recognized by Schwab as his spiritual leader. Schwab had Camara speak at the fourth annual meeting in 1974 of the European Management Forum, which later, which was later renamed the World Economic Forum, despite it being against the law in Switzerland at the time to allow a communist to speak. The message he delivered was about learning to see the world from the standpoint of the poor oppressed in their favelas, their slums. So this is what I had to say about the Ferrarian education. I appreciate you uh, indulging me as I walked through this entire thing for you so that you could uh, better understand it. This is, in a sense, a pretty decent, in my opinion, capstone on what we've said about Ferrari so far. I will come back to the pedagogy of the oppressed for completeness, but for the moment, since I know you probably won't take the time to read it, I know it took me an hour and 40 minutes to read it to you out loud, uh, many of you will not actually read it. I wanted to put it out in audio form as well. Uh, with some editorializing and some additional explanations to add clarity. And so there you go. That is the Frarian entry to the uh, Social Justice Encyclopedia, the translations from the Wokish on the New Discourses website at newdiscourses.com, where you should go and send your friends. Thanks for listening. Until next time. <laughs>